see everybody this morning. Thank you for being here at Crossroads. So good to be with family and worshiping the King of Kings. We're going to continue in our worship this morning and get our hearts and our minds focused on the greatness of our God. Good morning. Good morning, Crossroads family and friends. I'm so very glad that each and every one of you are here. You know, life um, has purpose, and life has great meaning. 
And uh, you are here today because God intended for you to be here. There's a purpose uh, for you being here and great meaning for you to be here. And every day you wake up, God desires to uh, deliver a peace, a perspective into your life to give you power. You know, perspective has a way of giving us power, a way to give us life, to make it more enriching. And so I am in prayer that your heart will be open enough to receive that peace, that perspective, and uh, that purpose that God wants to remind you of why you're here. Do you know that you're uh, very valuable to God today? I feel led to tell you that, that God loves you so much that he values you so much that he uh, gave his uh, only begotten son to die on a cross. Uh, to die for your sins so you can be forgiven and have life with him and not just life with him now but life with him forever in heaven and so that's a great destiny that's a great threefold promise and so i'm so very glad you're here if you're a guest here today we're so very glad you chose crossroads as your place of worship uh, on the back of each chair there is a guest or visitor card uh, it's yellow in color form if you don't, in case you don't know and then if you would just take some time you don't have to but we'd love for you we'd love to know of the uh, um the presence you had here, uh, keep us a record of that, and to be able to follow up, too, and answer any questions you may have about our fellowship here. So we are a small fellowship here in Craven County that desires to, uh, to grow in our relationship with God and with each other, because God intended for us to be a family, a family of God that um, gives us a glimpse of what heaven is like and living together, friends forever, family forever. So... Let us continue to uh, pray and stay in the spirit, the spirit um, and the flow uh, that he desires uh, to flowing through this worship service. So let's uh, stay in stride, stay in step with him and, and flow um, with his spirit today. Pray with me. God, we come here today. Many of us um, come from an assortment of experiences, perhaps issues or challenges that we face. Um, we come here uh, maybe um, tired, maybe um, we come here um, with um, difficulties that we don't know how we can overcome, but we know, Father, and believe, for those of us that know you, that um, you have a way of taking people in pitiful situations, people in pits, and to turn their uh, situation into pearls from difficulties to diamonds. Father, you have a way of taking hardship and making us more hardy people, people that can persevere, and to um, be able to still love others and know that our life has purpose and that you're always trying to connect us uh, to others, to have impact on others, to have influence, to encourage others, to love others with the love of Christ. And so we come here worshiping you, a God, who can save us, a God who can rescue us, a God who can deliver us and heal us and um, love us, Father, in a way that only you can love us. So we pray, God, we open our hearts to you and your spirit. You would descend in a way uh, that is, is thick and mighty, and we would open our hearts to you. We worship you, Lord. You are worthy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Ah, good to see everybody. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. All right. Let's all stand and worship some more. Can never worship enough. <laughs>
It's that time where we have our children come forward. We have a, a children's moment. We have a special devotion for our kids. If you want to come on down. Come on down, kids. No, it's green, but oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Well, you guys are a great looking group of kids. I have an opening question here to get right to it here. What is this? Do you guys know what this is? A thank you card. That's right. That's right. Have you guys ever written one? Yeah. Yeah. When's the last time you guys wrote uh, a thank you card or told somebody thank you for something? Anybody want to share a time? Anybody? You got one? You got one? Yesterday? Okay, tell us about it. Yesterday I was hanging out with a couple of my friends at a house. And then, like, okay, so she gave me uh, two pieces of pizza for lunch, and then I said thank you. Okay, very good. Very good. You got one too? Okay. Yesterday I... Got a Minecraft Lego set. And you told somebody thank you? Yeah. <laughs> Who'd you tell? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Is it good to say thank you? Yeah? Well, I have a, uh, a word uh, from the Bible that tells us that we should, uh, you know, we should issue thank yous. In fact, we should thank yous regularly. How often do you think we should say thank you to God or someone else? How often do you think? One time a day, one time a week, once a month, once a year? What do you think? Every day. I like those answers. Every day. I like that. Well, the Bible agrees with you. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says this. Check this out. We should be thinking of things throughout our day to tell God to tell him thank you. In fact, we should be able to say thank you to God for something in every situation we find ourselves in. No matter what the circumstances are, um, we should be continually thankful, giving thanks to God, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Think about this. It's the will of God that we thank him continually, which would mean every day, even in difficult situations. Now that's tough to do, is it? Not to thank him in difficult situations? I mean, why would you want to thank God for a difficult situation, right? Well, it doesn't say necessarily thank him for the difficult situation, but we can thank him just for knowing who he is. If we're saved, we know that we have a relationship with him, and that's something to be thankful enough, right? Well, you guys, I want to share a story here with you all that um, is an incredible story about Jesus um, with these Ten lepers. Have you guys familiar with the story with Jesus with ten lepers? Do you guys know what leper, lepers are? Lepers are people that have a disease called leprosy. And there are sores that can form. And um, some people believe you know, that they could get infected from uh, another person that has it. And so a lot of times they were ostracized um, or didn't want to be around those people because they were considered dirty or impure or unclean. And so one time Jesus went to this village, in Luke 17, he went to this village, and there was ten lepers off to the side, away, away from society. You know, they were outcasts, and they yelled out, uh, Jesus, um, we know, you know that you are master, um, and so we believe you could do a miracle, and we would love for you to do a miracle. Can you heal us? And Jesus said, if you go to a priest, go find a priest, okay? Because in the Old Testament, it said that if you were healed miraculously, you were to go to a priest and show him. They weren't even healed yet, but Jesus is already telling them to go walk towards a priest. And he says, if you go walk towards a priest, they're like pastors like I am in that day. And he said, um, you'll be healed. And you know what? As they were walking towards this priest, wherever he was, wherever they knew him to be, as they were walking there, they looked at their skin, and all of a sudden it was miraculously transforming and healed them. And they were amazed. And they began to shout and um, celebrate. But only one of them, only one of them,
came back to Jesus and bowed down and said, thank you, thank you for healing me. And Jesus said to him, weren't there ten of you? Why only one come back and thank me? So here's the point. The more thankful we are, we're like that one leper who came back to Jesus, that we come back to church and thank him for all the things we got to experience in the week, right? All the food we got, all the things he may have done, did it may have done miracles. But if we're less thankful, if we're not very thankful, then we're more like those other uh, lepers, right? The nine, what's that? Yeah, that, that we're not very thankful. And so we want to be more like the guy that came back and was very, very thankful. We have much to be thankful about. In fact, what are something you have to be thankful for? Anything at all that happened, even today or yesterday? The fact that you were born. The fact you're born. Alive. The fact you're alive. The fact you have life. That's very good, y'all, that he would say that, that you recognize that. That's very deep. You're a very deep individual. Um, and so we have so much to be thankful for. You know, having an attitude of gratitude is not only healthy for our minds and our hearts, but it actually keeps us closely connected to God and is good and healthy for our spirits. Do you realize that? Okay. I'm thankful that you guys are here, and I'm very thankful that we can grow in thankfulness. In fact, I want to issue you guys a challenge, a 3 plus 3 challenge. So most of you eat three meals a day, right? I want you, whoever you're eating your next meal with, to stop, take time, and think of one extra thing you can thank God for that's happened to up to that point, right? Does that make sense? So you not only thank God for your meal, you're thanking God for something that just happened the last three or four hours. So... You thank him for three meals you get, right? If you add one thing to each of those meals, you'd have three more things to thank him for. That's growing in thankfulness. Does that make sense? And so I, want, I would love for you guys to thank uh, God uh, that much. All right? It'd be cool to give our people a challenge uh, to say, hey, I challenge you to go out there and buy a gift card to somebody like a cashier this week and tell them, you know, I just want to thank you for your service to this community. You're often overlooked um, and often um, underestimated as to your value and how you help us. Here's just a token of love from God because we at Crossroads believe that um, we are to um, grow in our love for people. And we just want to appreciate you. Wouldn't that be cool if we did that? Everybody here, 100 people took a gift card and went out there and just said, Hey, I just want to give this to you because I'm thankful to God for you for serving us. Right? So we want to be a church that grows in thankfulness, right? Thank you guys for coming. I'm going to pray, and I have something here for you guys, okay? Let's pray. God, we thank you uh, for the gift of life, as Casey said. That life is um, incredible. It's, uh, it's fun. There are adventures, uh, things to learn. Uh, learning is life-giving in itself. And we thank you for meeting other people, meeting new people here today. Uh, these kids we are thankful for. We're thankful that they're thankful. Um, Lord, help us to grow in thankfulness. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, here's something for you. That's right.
Thank you, Margaret. We're very thankful for our folks like Margaret who are multi-talented in teaching and uh, playing the piano. So, um, Margaret, thank you. And uh, we should be a thankful church. We have many things to be thankful for today. I'm thankful for you being here. I'm thankful that we have a place to come and worship uh, with the freedom that we have been given. And uh, thank you, thank God for the soldiers uh, that he has raised up over the uh, generations. And there's so many things to be thankful for. In fact, I'm thankful that uh, today what I'm about ready to uh, preach on is uh, one that if you can master, you will have uh, an incredibly much more enriching and fulfilling life. And so I'm going to dive right into that. In fact, I'm curious to know, has anyone here ever had a day where uh, nothing just seemed to go right? Anybody here? Maybe even recently, maybe last week, right? Uh, has anyone ever taken on perhaps like uh, taking on a small challenge or faced a, a small little issue that um, on the surface it s- would seem like it would just take a maximum of maybe two hours to resolve or fix, but end up taking two weeks and it's still not resolved. Anybody ever face that? Uh, all I can say is I can feel your pain. Uh, I can just uh, say uh, these words. I tried to convert an AT&T phone to a Verizon account for a family member. Uh, what took, should have took two hours has taken about two weeks. <laughs> but anyway, I feel your pain. But God spoke to me in the middle of that recently, and uh, I'll share with you uh, what he said in a minute. But how many of you, I wonder, uh, when you compare your lives to this point, to the lives of others, you might feel like, you know, uh, my life, I seem to get just the crumbs when other people seem to get the crumb cake. And, and that's the title of today's message, by the way, How to Turn the Crumbs of Life into Crumb Cake. Because I can guarantee you God has a way of masterfully converting, transforming um, those kinds of things into beautiful, wonderful things that he wants you to take a hold of and to realize. You know, if you talk to enough people, in fact, in life, if you talk to enough, I bet you could do a survey. Eventually, you're going to come across someone that's even going to say, uh, not only have I had crummy days, um, or crummy, uh, you know, life, I, I just feel like, um, you know, there's, there's no hope for my, my situation. But I'm here to tell you that uh, there's good news for you. There's good news that if you feel like you're in a pit, God can take that pit and, and turn it into pearls. You know, maybe if you feel like you're in a, a difficult situation, He can simply convert those difficulties in, into diamonds. Our lives are diamonds in the rough, and He can take... Uh, you know, hard situations and, and make us more hardy and, and things like that. Listen, God can take the crumbs of anybody's life and turn it into crumb cake. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Before you leave this afternoon, um, I believe that God wants you to have a new approach to life. In fact, if you don't have life in Christ, he wants you to have a new life. You can have a new life today before you leave here. A life that enables you to open your eyes, to see through lens much differently, uh, to have the mind of Christ And that you can see and understand how God can utilize all the pains of life and redeem them. God's a redeeming kind of God. That your pain and suffering can have redemptive value. In fact, that little phone challenge that I alluded to earlier, um, that I endured uh, the last few weeks, at some point I asked God in the middle of all that, I said, uh, Lord, this is just seeming to be a waste of time. Is all this time wasted? To which he said this, Your efforts are sending a message of love to the one you're helping. You see, our efforts, even if it doesn't get fixed, if you're having efforts or making sacrifices because you're trying to help someone, they value that. And they know that you're trying to help them. They know that you're sending a message of love to them. You see, in God's economy, efforts to love are never in vain. Are they not? They're they're never in vain. In God's economy, um, all of our efforts... All of our pain, it can be redeemed and even rewarded because there's a God in heaven today who is watching everything we do. He's keeping count. He's watching, and and he loves and he delights in converting uh, your situation into something more valuable, more than the eyes can see, oftentimes in the moment. Sometimes it's not until later that you look back and you realize what God was trying to do. But God is into rewarding um, us. Um, You know, the guy that I went to the Verizon store in, in New Bern. At one point, after an hour and a half, 
of helping me, he said to me, um, I better get a good Christmas dinner for this. <laughs> you know, but I got to think in my mind, he doesn't have to worry whether he gets a Christmas dinner from me. Because there's a God in heaven, if he knows this God in heaven, I don't know if he does or not, uh, but he will get something much, much more, more better than a Christmas dinner that I could ever give him, crumb cake or Christmas cake or fruit cake or Chris, whatever it is. There's a God who is always up to something better. There's a God who's always working, always working on us and always willing to give us perspective, which gives us power, which is a reward in itself. But ultimately, at the end of our lives, God will reward us for any effort that was done to advance the kingdom or to love on someone um, and, or to be the people that he wanted us to be. And so that's the message today. Um, you know, God is a master at delighting. He's a master. He's a master at converting, converting problems and converting those problems and to helping us become the people he intended us to be. In fact, we're going to look at some, some of these problems that people faced in the early church and how God converted a difficult situation to actually getting the gospel out, having the gospel furthered. And so God can do this. And so let's take a look uh, at today's text in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. And so read here with me. It says, And Saul approved of the killing of Stephen. On that day a great Persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria. And proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. And so to recap there, a quick uh, synopsis or summation, we see persecution turning into praise. Did you see that at the end? What well, started off as persecution, by the end, God's people were praising him for what they began to see uh, God orchestrating and, and doing all along behind the scenes and, and doing. And so this is a, a, an incredible story here. How if I was to only give you one point today, it would be this. And it's this. God can providentially orchestrate our pain to fulfill a promise. God can providentially orchestrate our pain to fulfill a promise. In fact, in this text here, we see that actually their pain, their hardship, was used providentially, sovereignly, divinely. It was predicted a while back that the spread of the gospel would go out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to all the ends of the earth. You know, it's time. Sometimes Christians get comfortable and God will throw things at us and then cause us to get discomfortable and realize um, that we're not about what we're supposed to be about. And he can cause revival to uh, birth out of something such as this even that they were uh, dispersed and scattered and the gospel was spread and so that's an incredible thing you see uh, our pain can serve heaven's gain that's an easy thing to remember right our pain can actually serve heaven's gain you know perhaps if we have to go to the hospital Maybe God could have secretly orchestrated it, I'm not saying all the time, but it's possible he could have orchestrated it, even ordained it or ordered it, so that when we go to the hospital, there may be a nurse that needed encouraged, or there could have been a doctor uh, that needed to hear the gospel, or someone that needed to hear you know, the good news, or how their life um, can be changed. You see what I'm saying? How God can do that behind the scenes. And so, as a believer, we are promised that none of our pain is in vain. Romans 8, 28, right? God works for the good of all those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. So he works all things. So our pain is never in vain. In fact, our pain often is heaven's gain. And other people benefit as a result of our pain. We just don't see it oftentimes in the moment or in the middle of situation or even in situations or dire straight uh, circumstances. But God is genius at redeeming our hardship, pain, and suffering. In fact, I believe he delights in turning evil on its head. We see where Joseph, you know, in the Old Testament, where, you know, he was thrown into a pit, left for dead, and then he was later, you know, 
kidnapped in a way and taken to Egypt. And long story short, uh, famine you know, came across the land of, of Israel and Joseph's family. Not only was the country given um, blessings and have a turnaround in you know, giving uh, food and grain despite their hardship and lack of rainfall, God was able to rejuvenate the country using Joseph as second in command in bringing about this uh, miracle, but also his family was reunited after all of that. And so we can look from this text and we can see all kinds of hardship being converted. Let's look at just all the pains that they experienced in this text, for example, that you may have overlooked. Because when I did this, this is incredible, uh, I realized. So look at this text here. Let's identify just even different, even different words that identify uh, pain and hardship that these early disciples experienced. Here's a key word, killing. Go back to verse 1, if we could. Look at, there was a, there was a, a killing. Uh, Saul approved of the killing of Stephen. Now, Stephen was a leader of the church. He was a newly elected deacon. He was a godly man. And I don't know about you, but when a church loses a godly person, a very loving individual, uh, a, a deacon with character and commitment that's devoted to God, it'll put a church in mourning. Just that itself, just that one death there. Our church has experienced um, loved ones, you know, that have, have um, lost a husband. Margaret's lost her husband, Rodney. You know, well, we, we lost Rodney with her, and it, it put us in, in mourning. Uh, you know, Bobby Lewis, when she lost um, her husband, and uh, Mary Tyson, I go on and on. Uh, we have many here that are widows and wid widowers. Uh, when we lose uh, our church family members, we mourn, do we not? And so they're in, they're in mourning here. And so this, uh, it says in verse 2, godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. And by the way, it takes great courage to remain and to bury him because even then in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean area in, in Bible times, even then, if you did not um, bury someone that was very sacrilegious and uh, did not value that, that person, so they stayed behind, put themselves in jeopardy, put themselves on the line of being killed by staying there and, and, and putting themselves in harm's way, but they stayed behind. It says the apostles stayed, many of them stayed behind. Well, here's another thing. Not only was there a killing, which insinuates pain, there was great persecution. So persecution um, went even beyond killing. But there's not just small persecution here, by the way. We see an adjective, great persecution. Great persecution is being broke out here um, on the church. And so this is a large-scale persecution. And so what I'm saying is this. The early Christians faced a crummy situation. They faced a crummy situation. They're getting the crumbs of life. And this persecution was causing different pains, a pain level on different levels, such as, um, I don't know if you noticed, but many of them were put into jail. They were put into jail. And so, I don't know about you, but how many, if you've ever spent time in jail, that's unpleasant, especially when you're, put, when you're jailed unjustly. So the person in jail is experiencing difficulty and pain, but how about the members related to that person or the friends of that person they're also in pain for knowing that they're separated from that loved one, right? And so that's a pain in itself, if you look at both sides of the coin. And so something we don't think about, but between losing people to death in persecution, losing people going to jail because of this persecution, and then also seeing people dispersed. In other words, they ran, they, a lot of them ran uh, to safeguard their families. They were dispersed. They spread out to... Uh, unfamiliar and foreign lands. And so what I'm saying is this. The church is losing membership rapidly. Does that make sense? The church is in pain because they're losing members. And anytime you lose members, it's, it's painful. And they're losing them rapidly. Probably wondering, where is this, all this chaos going? You know, the enemy just seems to be separating us, scattering us. You know, this is, it seems to be a mess. It seems to be chaotic. In fact, in verse 3, if we put up, verse 3 says, But Saul began to destroy the church. So it's being destroyed through putting people to death, putting people in jail, having people run for cover, having them migrate to distant lands. And so the church is losing membership and losing it rapidly. And so I don't know about you, but if you've been watching the uh, news lately, uh, you know, in Florida, the hurricane hit. 
And so you see uh, a lot of destruction, a lot of people being displaced. In fact, one of our members was sharing somebody they know down there in Florida saying that they um, put a friend up that had lost their house to you know, the flooding, and then they uh, had left for a week, and then their house got flooded. They lost their house. And so people are being displaced, and that causes pain when you're displaced. And this is some things we don't often think about. Uh, if we look at verse 4 here, verse 4 and 5, we see this uh, being displaced going on. Verse 4 says, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Well, wherever they went, where was that? Well, one of the places it says right there. It says that they went to Samaria. You can give us an example of one of the uh, Christians, one of the evangelists named Philip, that went to this place called Samaria. It doesn't say specifically in Samaria where, but the thing is, when you are uprooted from your home, how many of you ever had to, to move when you didn't want to move? That can be very difficult. Because when you have to, to move, you know, you have to uh, lose a lot of friends um, or even family or, or neighbors that you are familiar with. You have to remove your kids from school that they might lose their friends. They lose their familiar surroundings and a situation that they like. And we, we take this for granted, this whole text is what I'm trying to say to go deeper here, and that the, there was a lot of pain here, a lot of pain, pain within this Christian community that's going on here. But the great news is, is that this scattering ends up to being a, a splattering or spreading of the good news. And Jesus predicted it. In fact, Matthew 24, 9, Jesus said, Then they will deliver you over to be persecuted and killed, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. God was even using this um, to fulfill a promise, even. In Acts 1.8, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we see Philip here being the first here in initiating this fulfillment of this prophecy, or this promise, this vision that God had of, of having the ends of the earth reached for him. For, um, with the gospel. And so what I'm saying here is these early Christians went from being battered to being mattered. They went from being battered to being mattered. You know, sometimes we get beat down in life. We get beat up and, you know, lose a lot or we, we feel like, God, are you there? Do you care? I'm in pain here. This doesn't seem to even go. I mean, what's this even going towards? You ever been there? You ever thought, what is the purpose behind all this? This just seems chaotic. There's no rhyme or reason. I can't connect the dots. Where are you? Certainly I'm in pain. There can't be any purpose behind this. But there is. That's where we miss it oftentimes. That God is providentially orchestrating many things and doing things behind the scenes. There's actually a supernatural strategy behind it. And we just don't often see it. Because this pain was predicted. That's why Jesus, he gives us his word so we can go back and look at it and say, Hey, we shouldn't be surprised here. This was actually predicted. This is, in fact, not only predicted, this is fulfilling a promise. And this promise is good. This promise is actually working out for mankind a good thing. And it always goes back to God's goodness, and he's always trying to work out a good thing. You know, we are, uh, a lot of people are saddened by what's going on in Florida. But what's not put on the news is God's working something out, and probably in a lot of those lives, he's divinely orchestrating perhaps a lot of people that don't know Christ. That hardship could be the impetus. He's working behind that to cause them to, on their backs to look up for the first time and try to make sense of their life. And that causes a lot of people for the first time to come to know Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. And that's a good thing. It's a great thing when that happens, folks. We don't always see the end of the picture. And that's what God is trying to get us to see, to cultivate our minds, that not all that meets the eye can be spiritually seen in that moment. In the eye of the storm, sometimes we don't, you know, understand. But the one who makes the hurricanes, he's eyes on everything. He understands the direction that it's going to all the time. And if you are open to it, just like I did with that phone, God can speak to you like, is this, Lord, I just seem like this is a waste of time. Where is this going? He spoke in a nanosecond to me and said, it's not a waste of time. Your efforts are sending a message. Listen here today, folks. Your efforts are sending a message. If you invite people to church or, and they don't come and, and you get discouraged for maybe inviting them to come to Wednesday night meals, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. God sees that effort. You're planting seeds. Seeds, sometimes they don't, they don't blossom overnight. 
I don't know, any uh, bean seed or corn seed. Is there bean seeds? I don't know. What I mean. <laughs> Whatever seeds you plant in soil, they oftentimes don't sprout overnight is what I'm saying. It takes time. It takes time. We have to cultivate. You have to water it, and, and it just takes time. Your seeds take time, but your efforts are not in vain. Even if you never see anything come from it, come to fruition in this lifetime, God's aware of your efforts, and he will reward you at the right time. But if anything... I tell you one of the greatest rewards is just in process, just feeling God's Spirit infuse me and download me as I'm spreading, as I'm doing, as I'm putting effort, as I'm doing good deeds. And you feel the flow of the Spirit. That's a reward in itself. Even if I didn't see the reward in heaven that's coming, I just feel what's going on in the relationship I have with God and feeling close to Him. And for me, that's all I want in life, to be honest. I just want to feel close to God. I just want to have God in my life and feel the warmth of His love. And the care, that's what I treasure and want most from life. And so here we see God turn persecution, persecution into propagation of the gospel. God can convert pain even into power. We feel weak sometimes in our pain. But actually God can take that, that pain, that weakness, and transform it into power. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. And it made him feel weak. He prayed three times for it to be removed. But what did God say? My power is made perfect in your weakness, in fact. And it's God's power that's put on display. They can only be explained why you're able to trudge ahead, why you can move ahead. And people say, how are you able to move ahead with all this going against you? And you still have a smile on your face, and you still um, have hope and, and faith in God. And God has done this countless times. Scripture is replete with stories over and over and over and over again to get us the point, to get through our heads that in so many situations, people found themselves in a pit or in the mud or in a dire state situation, and God was able to turn it around. You see, God is into having us prosper in very difficult situations. Now, I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher. I'm not saying God's going to give you a million dollars for hanging in there. What's often overlooked and not preached and taught is a lot of times the Bible, when it speaks of prospering, it's talking about spiritually prospering. Spiritually prospering. And feeling the presence and fullness of God and His might and power and presence in your life. It's interesting that the meaning of scattering, if you look up the Greek word, it means uh, diasporentes. It means to scatter, like seed, to sow throughout, disperse, distribute in foreign lands. These Christians were becoming seedlings for the gospel. They were becoming seeds in God's garden. In this bigger picture, this bigger scheme, this bigger thing in life that we oftentimes don't see. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a situation where uh, it just seems like it's uh, not a lot going on. Where there's a, a drought or, or it's just seem not, people don't seem to be responding in great measure. But then God will give me perspective. Somebody will say something, something will happen later and I'm thinking, oh, I see you. I, I now see what you're trying to do. We don't always see it in that moment. I came across a story of a Dr. Ted Roberts. I don't know if you know who Dr. Ted Roberts is, um, but in two weeks I came across stories of Top Gun pilots. <laughs> well, Dr. Dr. Roberts, Dr. Roberts was raised in a very dysfunctional, abusive home. In fact, he was raised by an alcoholic mother and seven, seven very mean and cruel stepfathers. That she, you know, um, partner, you know, became her, his, his mom, you know, had relationships with. And so he had seven mean stepfathers that passed through his childhood. And so his early painful years, it drove him to excel in every field that he entered. So he was determined. He tried to convert uh, this down and out situation to a determination to do something with his life. And so he um, was the first in his family to finish college. He later graduated as a top pilot top fighter pilot in the academy, and he qualified to be one of only 4% of students to serve as a U.S. Marine fighter pilot. Well, fast forward in 1969, um, his life reached a major turning point. While he was half drunk in the middle of a rocket attack in Vietnam, he read a love letter from his wife, Diane, speaking of her love for the Lord and him. And that's when he Right there, Johnny on the spot made a commitment to accept Christ as his Lord and Savior in that bunker, which would change the course of his life forever. Because shortly after his conversion, he felt called to minister to men, men specifically. 
Um, but upon, and I'll go back to that in a little bit later, but upon returning to the U.S., Dr. Roberts started ministry to men in the squadron where he was instructor, and he led over 50% of the students he instructed and 30% of his fellow instructors to Christ. This is phenomenal in the military. In his words, Dr. Roberts says it was like converting a brothel. <laughs> Fast forward, in 1985, Dr. Roberts, he's now the uh, back he, where he became the senior pastor of East Hill Church in one of the most unchurched areas or regions in America. It exploded to over 7,000 members in the state of Washington. And, and so Ted uh, began to see how even though what began to uh, seem like a very crummy life in formation, even when he was half drunk in the middle of a desperate situation in uh, Vietnam, he gave his life to Christ, and that was the beginning of God planting some seeds in his life from pain to purpose. And so oftentimes we don't see it um, in the moment. And also, Ted Roberts has this ministry called Pure Desire, where he's helping people uh, across our country, uh, specifically men, overcome this stronghold of pornography, pure desire, not to shame them, but to help them. And that is their plan. Um, and so he has been used by God in great ways, in great measures, all from his own experience and his own addiction he talks about with that himself. And so he um, has been used by God to bring um, revival to many people's lives. And what seemed to be, you know, in the moment, seeming nothing, God has used this man and has scattered seeds to thousands of people worldwide even for the gospel and for people to experience uh, the delight and joy of, of knowing God as their Savior. Listen, Romans 3, 5, 3-5 three through five says this, We can rejoice in our sufferings. We can rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope, and hope does not disappoint, does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I like the New Living Translation. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us to develop strength of character, and it grows our faith. I wonder, for many of you here today, what hardship might you be facing? Are you able to find God in the middle of that hardship? Are you looking for God in the middle of that hardship? What difficult circumstances does God want to speak to you in, even now? Have you ever thought about how God can convert your pain into heaven's gain and that your pain is never in vain? That's what God wants you to realize today. It's even possible that God may have even ordained some of your pain to fulfill a promise he's always had of your life, a destiny that he wants to give you to be fulfilled, but the pain is going to give direction because oftentimes in the middle of our pain, it can be a catalyst to change, to making changes that we need to make all along, that we didn't realize, and that God's actually given direction to get towards that destiny that God had always envisioned that's something much better and grand and greater than we could ever imagine for ourselves in our own if we were to create our own lives. Because our lives are so much more littler, our dreams sometimes often much littler than God's. And so I encourage you today, before even the end of the service, to ask God how to help you accept your thorn, where, whatever it is, whatever is afflicting you, to help you see where God is there in the middle of it with you. Ask God what he can bring forth from your pain. Have you ever done that? Have you ever prayed, God, what can you bring forth from this pain I'm experiencing? What are you trying to show me? How are you trying to just connect some dots? Are you trying to connect me with someone? Um, Ask God to show you the benefits from the past pain perhaps you've experienced and how he used it to benefit your life in making you the person you are today perhaps. What did you learn? How did you grow from it? Ask God for some practical steps and you'll see God begin to take shape and form out of that. Listen, God has an expert. He's an expert at taking even evil and multiplying growth from it. God can grow us from anything, our grief to many things. Listen here, here's uh, how other people actually benefited. We not only benefit, by the way, from our pain, such as we underestimate in our culture today the value of character development, by the way. Character 
character, character is oftentimes minimized and overlooked and underscored. And there is so much to be said because, if anything, I think one of the greatest accomplishments in life is not what you attain or accumulate possession-wise or material-wise, but it's who you became while you were here. In other words, the more you become like Christ is the ultimate. It's our character that God is trying to form and shape through our difficult situations and dire state, straight situations. It's our character. We've got to value character. And so you see back in those verses from Romans that we take delight and rejoice in our sufferings. What, why? Because it can develop our character. And as our character is being developed, we can see Christ. You can even feel Christ in the middle of those moments and say, I'm, I feel I can feel Christ. I can feel the sensation of him being formed in me. And that character also then develops our faith. We actually accumulate and accrue more faith. Does your faith not grow as you see God changing you and transforming you? It should grow our faith. And that faith is propelling us towards an even greater destiny that he has for us with heaven ultimately being the end sight of it all. But here's a second thing that we can glean from this. It's not only God orchestrating a pain to fulfill his promise for us or a prophecy or a vision for us, but our pain can also be others' gain. Our pain can also be others' gain. Look at verse 6, 7, and 8 here. Verse 6, 7, and 8 here. It says, When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention. In other words, these signs and miracles were opening their hearts to uh, something even greater than being physically healed. It's actually opened their hearts to the gospel. But something else is happening here, too. They benefit these people as a result of them being scattered and spread out across the provinces. It says in verse 7, For with shrieks, impure spirits came out. In other words, they were being delivered from these demonic spirits. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So people were healed. You ever think for a second that our pain, God may have always had in mind and in sight the gain of somebody else? Well, we don't like that in our culture because we're such a, a me-centered, focused culture that I want my pain to be all about me. I feel I can find something out of it. That's great. But we never really did ever consider how our pain could actually, God being used using it to cause the gain of someone else? You know, how many parents make sacrifices for their children, which entails pain, right? But we do it, what? To our children to gain, so they can be, you know, one day men and women of God, that they can have character um, and teach discipline. So they're gaining from our sacrifices, just on a small scale that we see how others benefit from our sacrifices and our own pain. So we see other people uh, benefiting here, and they are all leaping for joy. One last concluding word before we go. In the middle of your hardship, don't ever think that God doesn't care. He cares. He always cares. He never gives up on caring. He never stops caring. It's not in his character to stop caring, to not care. He always cares. Care is the outflow of his character, of who he is, who he is in his personhood. And he always cares. And we see that reflected in people. People are imperfect at caring. But here we see in verse 2, it says that these Christians mourn deeply over the death. I believe God's right there with them. You think, well, does it make sense if God could avoid mourning over people if he would have stopped that situation to begin with? <laughs> Don't try to figure everything out. <laughs> All I'm saying is God's caring for you in the middle of that situation. They stayed behind. You know, the church is to be an army. It's, it's, to, be a, a, it's a, to be a the Marines, it's to be the military where no one's left behind. That we make ultra-sacrifices you know, in going the extra mile and trying to reach people for Christ, that we don't stop giving up, we don't stop quitting, and that even in the middle of our pain, we, stop, we start realizing that there's something at the end of this. Something is going to come of this. Something is going to be born of this. Because God is a God of strategy. God is a God who wants you to realize this. And so we come here today um, with, with good news, that God can take your crumbs and turn it into crumb cake. It's all the ingredients of your life is fashioning and forming into something much more grand and marvelous than you can see, and it always meets the eye. So when you get burned out, and you feel like, well, I'm going to end up burning that crumb cake. <laughs> Listen, God is masterful in the right timing with his sensitivity. Even in the middle of your pain, he's close by, and he wants to hold you. He feels, he feels for you. It's a feeling God. You know, two of the most powerful words in Scripture is Jesus wept. Jesus empathizes with us. The Bible says, even in Hebrews, we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us, 
that even in our suffering, we have a God who sympathizes with us. Listen, I wonder if there's anybody here that might not have God in their life, but wants God in their life. Well, I got good news. He wants to be in your life. He wants to be in your life. In fact, he's brought you here so that you can hear his love for you and feel in his spirit in this room that he is drawing you to himself by even giving you the desires to even want him in your life. Maybe some are, are here that actually want more of God. You have God. Or maybe you've had more of God in the past, but you want more of God now. That for whatever reason, you know, life can wax and wane with our wantingness of God. And perhaps it's been waning more than waxing of late. God wants you to be full, maxed out, in wanting him. Do you have eternal life in Christ? Are you heaven bound? Before you go today, God wants you to know you can be heaven bound because God loves you and he has a place for you. And finally, you're here on planet earth until you die because there's someone else out there that needs you. There's someone out there that needs your love. There's someone else out there that needs your influence, your impact, that needs just to hear you say, God loves you. God loves you. You know that goes a long ways? There was a generation in the past where men didn't tell their kids, I love you. Well, I'm here to tell you I love you because God loves you. Let's close with that. God, we come here today rejoicing with the affirmation from your word and in your spirit to the hearts of men and women and children here today that you are sending a message out as you always have that you love us. You love us. You love people. You love men and women, teens and children. You love people. And I'm so glad people like Franklin Graham are going out on a tour called the God Loves You Tour. Help us to join that tour. We don't have to go with him wherever those cities he's going to. we got a city right here that needs to hear God loves you. So let's go on a God Loves You Tour here in Craven County. May this church at Crossroads Baptist Church rise up and join you, join the ranks of a God-loving army that we desire to see other people join and be recruited to join and be in footstep together, to be in the trenches together. We can all relate to hardship and suffering. We've all been there. But God, it can teach us. And it can reach others that we don't even realize in the middle of that. There's purpose to our pain, and we thank you for that, God. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, wherever you are, uh, you come and... Uh, Express to me, I'll be up front. Um, Dave uh, Beeman, our chair deacons. Um, this may be your last day as chair. You'll still be a deacon, but um, so you come front, front. Uh, if you feel led to pray with David, we'll just station you there, David. We're going to try to get deacons of the month on tap to put in the bulletin so you can know our deacons better. And so you come. However, the Spirit leads. That's one closing song. You come, however, the Spirit moves and leads you.
See you just for a, a short, a very exciting uh, development here. Uh, it's been very pleasant for me, but um, we have uh, here two wonderful and beautiful young people that uh, have been coming to our church for a while. Uh, many of you uh, know them. Um, I'm starting to get to know them a little bit. Um, I've known this young man for uh, 28 years, um, as uh, he is my son, for those of you who are visiting. <laughs> and so... Uh, here's the quick miracle, though. Uh, they had lived in High Point. I think we moved them four times in four years. And I said, you're going to have to stop moving. It's, it's killing my back. Uh, you know. And so um, we've been praying that they would find a, a church home. We've been praying. You know, they had never found one in High Point. And so uh, my wife and I had prayed. And so that God not only moved them here, but they're coming to church here. And so that's an answered prayer. And so these are their beautiful uh, kids. This is uh, Haven. She's two. And this is Graylin. I think she's eight months. Is yeah. that right? Graylin. So Graylin and Haven um, are our first two grandkids. <laughs> so Graylin just said she wants to join too. Uh, so we thank you. I know baby language. That's what she said. She did say that. Uh, so anyway. So anyway, to no, with no further ado, if you all are in agreement that uh, you affirm and uh, accept their desire to join our fellowship here at Crossroads, if you would do so by a wholeheartedly uh, amen. 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 So you guys are approved. All right. 